started. Great, thank you. So the session is now being recorded. I wanted to briefly go through our agenda for today's session. We will have uh, 10 minutes presentations by each of the panelists. And uh, after that, we um, you can ask questions for the panelists. And uh, I think as we are only eight uh, of us, we can uh, do the discussion round in the main room. We thought we would do breakouts, but I think that's not necessary for us today. So I'm very excited to welcome our four panelists uh, for today's session. Uh, Lex Nederbrock from University of Oslo, Michael Landy, uh, from in Bioinformatics Hub of Kenya and Martin Dreyer from Northwest University and myself. <laughs> uh, we asked our panelists to present on an overview of Coventry's activities in their organization or region, projects that their regional subcommunities are working on and challenges they have experienced in their community region as it relates to the work of the Carpentries. Um, I will start with my presentation and then we'll hand over to Lex afterwards. Um, and as I said, if you have any questions during the presentations, please use the Etherpad to collect them so we can discuss them afterwards. Before I start, do you have any questions? I also paste the Etherpad again for you. Okay, so then I will start by sharing my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes we can. Cool. All right, so I mentioned briefly that I'm currently the regional coordinator at the Carpentries for the DACH region. That means I support the organization of workshops in Germany, Austria and Switzerland. I also um, help with all kinds of questions about the Carpentries and I'm there as a contact person for the region. I also work as a data librarian at ZEPIMET, the Information Center for Life Sciences in Cologne, Germany. Uh, here I'm also responsible for our training, uh, for example, generating training materials, organizing workshops and running them with my instructor colleagues. I would like to briefly share with you some information about our region or our regions. We currently have about 200 instructors in the DACH region and about 100 of them are located in Germany. Um, most of them are library and software carpentry instructors. It's at least that's their batch they got. And uh, we also have about five trainers, the ones that train the instructors. Uh, due to the fact that the community is already relatively large and the workshops have been held for years, uh, we see at least in our institution more and more demand for advanced workshops. This is where the Carpentries Incubator helps us at my institution. The Carpentries uh, Incubator is a place for collaborative development of new lessons. It provides a space for the Carpentries community to create tests and improve lessons supported by the system uh, processes and training that foster collaboration and enable better lesson design. There are now also many lessons in development that um, are for advanced workshops, for example, intermediate research software development skills in Python lesson material, which we really like to use uh, for now. And in our workshops, we find, especially in the library country workshops, that uh, it is incredibly important to understand each other. So instructors, uh, because of their ex expertise, often tend to use technical terms that learners don't understand because they haven't been exposed to the topics. And this is why we are now happy to participate in the Glossario project. Glossario is a multilingual glossary from the Carpentries for terms related to the computer science and data science. And everyone can participate in the glossary uh, via GitHub. The idea is to make Glossario available to the learners to quickly look up terms during or after a workshop. 
I was also asked about challenges within our region. I can speak from two perspectives on uh, this. Firstly, as the regional coordinator. Um, so with the Carpentries, there is the possibility to register centrally organized workshops. That means you put a request to the Carpentries for a workshop and instructors can volunteer. The instructors who voluntarily register for these workshops are mostly instructors who don't do not come from the Dach region, as I see, and uh, it is therefore often a challenge to bridge the different time zones. And another challenge that is related to the fact that um, as a regional coordinator, I only have a limited view of the community. So often I don't even know the different needs of the three regions, so Germany, Austria and Switzerland, and also see that the needs differ, not only in region, but also in the subject matter, whether um, it is the difference between software data and library carpentry workshop or subject differences as um, such as medicine and bioinformatics or research data management or library. Uh, what both challenges have in common is the lack of overview of such a large community. Uh, what I see as a huge opportunity is the new community development program uh, led by Alicia Kroll. And the main goal of the community development program is to improve the support of the Carpentry subcommunities to maximize the benefit to our community members and ensure the long term sustainability of the organizations as we continue to grow globally. Um, we define a subcommunity as a group of community members who serve in the same capacity within uh, the organization, are in the same geographic region, or come together because of common interests. So not only regional coordinator as I am now. Um, there's a quarterly call um, where you uh, support existing subcommunity leaders and. Uh, is for those who are looking to start a new sub-community, um, but also for members of the Carpentries community uh, are welcome to participate so everyone can come. I have linked you uh, the Etherpad in the slides. I can uh, post it in the chat later, uh, where you can see the dates for the calls and attend the meetings. Uh, one of, of, of the one idea of the program is that there's not just one regional coordinator like me now, but rather several community coordinators who do not necessarily have to be tied to the region. And I would like to recommend the program to everyone from my region. Uh, take a look, or not only my region, for everyone, take a look and become a part of the coordinators. In addition to the new community development program, I can also recommend getting together in smaller regions. Uh, so this is what I see from my institution's perspective. Here we offer workshops for different libraries or universities that don't have their own instructors yet, but might want to have. Um, and for this, the workshops do not have to be centrally organized, but self-organized. So find your own uh, little community in your region. Um, with this, I hope to see you in the discussion at the community development program. I think this is a really important step for all of us or help each other soon uh, at the first carpentry workshop. And I thank you for your attention. So, I will stop my presentation, but I will give you um, the links from my presentation. So first off, does it work? No, it won't. I will um, post it later for you but would suggest now we can start with Lex. Thank you very much. Um, that was interesting. I think we have a lot to discuss once we're all done presenting. Let me see, start the screen share there. 
you should now be able to see my first slide. So I am uh, representing University of Oslo, um, the initiative we now call Carpentry at UIO. University of Oslo in Norwegian is University of Oslo, UIO. And we even got a designer to make our own little logo, the mouse and the hammer, which we're very fond of. And we have a like a slogan that says workshops for basic skills in programming and data management at the University of Oslo. So I'm not representing a whole region, although we have the Nordic region. We did have a regional coordinator, but uh, that position could not be uh, prolonged. But I might, if people are interested, I could talk a little bit about the Nordic uh, because we have monthly calls and stuff like that. Um, so a brief overview of the carpentries in the region. I'm also following the four questions we have gotten. This is a, a word cloud I generated from the workshops we've had since 2012, the titles of the workshops. Um, so data management is a big one. Uh, analysis, Python, Shell, Unix, Git, GitHub, software are all uh, very popular. Um, we, we see often that if we announce a Python programming workshop, it is booked, fully booked in a few days. And often we have twice the amount of people as, uh, applying for a spot than we have spots. Unfortunately, with the low, with a high low, with a high no show rate, um, we also actually struggle a little bit with filling those seats. So we're yeah, sometimes deliberately overbooking. So we get every, everybody that's every seat that we have available filled. And the same with the R workshops, they're even worse. There's like really large interest. We're opening our workshops to people, not just from the University of Oslo. We also have the University of Oslo Hospital. We have uh, institutions and groups nearby that people can easily travel to us. And uh, so it's a bit larger than the University of Oslo, but most of our people come from University of Oslo. And this is the number of workshops we've been given. Um, we started very uh, modest in 2012, but after 2015, uh, we hooked up with the library, university library, and that is, has been a huge factor. So the university library provides us with the room booking and uh, they have a box of cables and sticky notes and other stuff. And so they enable the instructors to go to the room, meet the learners there, plug in the laptop and start teaching. So they take away a lot of the logistics uh, uh, from us. And then we had a, a nice growth to about 50 workshops a year, but a big drop in the pandemic. I'll come back a little bit about that, but we're starting to pick up and we're already seeing a lot of interest in teaching workshops in the fall. Note that we have, after a little while, found out that for since we have so many local instructors and so many local interesting in, learners interested, we often don't use the two-day model for the workshops, but take one module, one lesson, for example, the Python lesson or the Shell lesson, stretch it a little bit longer, give it a little bit more time, a full day or two half days or something, so we can really get to the finish and then teach only that. And that means that we're not often doing officially uh, official carpentry workshops because we don't fill the requirements for the for the curriculum, but we do manage to teach a lot more workshops and get people to come for one thing. And since we are able to teach often the other things they can learn the next time they sign up for a workshop. But that is basically because we, we have so many local instructors, we don't have to fly people in. Um, we also have uh, been inspired by the University of Florida Carpentry Club. Um, uh, they have a, a board elected from their uh, community. So we did the same a few, few years ago. Uh, made a website and a charter and election procedures. And uh, we have four people on the board that are elected from the community uh, for two year, two year terms. Um, and they're from different types of background in the university. And then two seats on the, on the board are from the university library, who's our, our host and they also fund a lot of the stuff. And we have recently opened the Digital Scholarship Center, which is a university library place or home for uh, these kind of courses for data management courses for courses that are related to the digital scholarship aspect of, doing, of being a researcher which we're very very happy with it's led by Matthew Good and he's also an observer when we have uh, board meetings and the digital scholarship center which some of you may have heard of from other universities especially in North America is our new um, home for the carpentry effort 
And I think that's going to help uh, help quite a bit. So we have at the moment 18 instructors, seven alumni. Uh, it's been going up and down a little bit. Um, we have had, we struggled with, well, I'll come back to that. We have a, um, the good situation that the university is paying for membership, which gives five seats for instructor training yearly. And we have three instructor trainers. It used to be four, but I at some point had to stop doing that. So we have now have three. Um, projects that the community members are working on. We actually also see people interested in in developing lessons themselves. We have the folks from the library that are pretty far ahead with making a Zotero lesson. A Zotero is a management system for references, both for citations and for the PDFs and everything. Uh, I started uh, together with one of the others um, a workshop on if you wanna do writing together on GitHub without the command line. So writing text to go on GitHub, but still something that we would like to find the time to put in the incubator. History folks are doing workshops. The Tidyverse, we have a workshop that is doing a slightly different setup than our workshops because its focus is quite quickly on Tidyverse and it's very, very popular. And I'm very happy that the folks that made it are now finally putting it in the incubator because I think it's going to be taught more that way. And we're doing local adaptations of uh, library carpentry lessons also in Norwegian. And we have had. Um, uh, for a long time, the wish to maybe do a Carpentry Connect Nordic, but it's it's waiting for time and energy. But it, I think it's going to happen at some point. Challenges for so the pandemic sincerely reduced activities, and we really lost instructors. And uh, the momentum we had going was basically gone because we did do some online training, but it wasn't really successful. People were not very motivated to do the training online. People were still motivated to attend, but there were not many instructors. But um, we did do some when it was possible again, some social meetups, sometimes with food. We did onboarding sessions for people that wanted to teach for the first time. And things are looking much, much better now than, than they used to be uh, about a year or a year and a half ago. Another challenge which I think many people will recognize is room booking, because we need rooms that are ideal for teaching. But the courses, the credited courses get priority, of course, and there's not enough of them. So we get to be the last ones to pick rooms and many of them are already fully booked. And especially if you want two rooms, two, one room, two days in a row, or maybe you want to do like a week long event or something, that's very, very difficult. The fact that we are now part of the Digital Scholarship Center means that luckily this center will have its own teaching room, which will be available full time for us. So that's going to probably solve this problem really nicely. And then we still have heard from people. Yeah, I just I learned recently for the first time heard about these carpenters workshops. And I'm in this little corner of the university and I've never heard of these things. And how do we reach everyone? I think this is in a, in a large university like University of Oslo, reaching everyone with the right information at the right time is very, very challenging. And then we had lots of instructor trainees. So they went to instructor training that they maybe even started doing the checkout procedure with these three steps uh, that you need to do like homework before you can become an instructor. And they either never finished or once they finished, they never taught. So the board has decided to start mentoring sessions so that the, the um, uh, five people that were actually more because we have some leftover seats that took instructor training this fall, we've been meeting with them monthly online first and in person later, checking up with them, how's it going? How's your checkout going? Do you have questions? Questions about Carpentry at Juio, and it really, really helped because, except for one, which is still in the pipeline, we're all finished now. And the next step, of course, is for us to get them to teach. So I think we should continue doing the onboarding, the mentoring sessions, and uh, check in with them regularly, also after now they're finished. Uh, to make sure really have them being taken care of, a feeling that they're taking, being taken care of, and they're they're wanted in our community, and and welcome them, and, and make sure that they actually start teaching. And of course, but this is kind of general. Most, most of our instructors are on non-permanent contracts and may leave for other jobs, other places. But that's kind of partially natural. So there will also be a flow of people coming in and out. But we do have been successful a little bit in recruiting from permanent staff. Uh, so we get people that are actually able to stay in, and get permission from their bosses to teach carpentry workshops as part of their job description. That's not, not always easy, but sometimes it's possible. There was also a question on how to ensure equitable access to the carpenters community and its resources. And one obvious one is translations, but we find that in Norway and in the Nordic countries, English is usually okay, it's sufficient, maybe not always for library carpentry, but for most places, English is perfectly fine. We have also many non-Norwegian 
English speaking attendance. But it is sometimes necessary to think about domain adjusting the lessons, for example, um, math examples we often have in programming classes are programming lessons are sometimes scaring off humanities folks because they did they choose humanities to get rid of the math. And although we might disagree with that it's difficult, but they still have to consider their their feelings around it and see if we can make examples that are more suitable for them, like based on text, for example. And we do have sometimes heard back from people that um, I'm so glad that I can hear what you're saying because I have hearing difficulty or see what you're saying because you use the right screen and we don't pay too much attention to it. It sometimes comes natural, but we do have a room for approval there to be much more conscious about accessibility in you know, all its levels. So I also pasted some links, but I put them on the slide, but I can also put them in the etherpad. We have our own little website uh, on GitHub, but we also have been very lucky to get uao.no slash carpentry, which leads to the university library page, uh, which is the one that you have on the QR code. And um, this actually was a part of a presentation I gave somewhere else, which is why I put the carpentry.org link in there, which is not really necessary for you. And I'll stop here. Thank you, Lex. That was also interesting. I put some questions on the etherpad. <laughs> okay, so uh, then let's continue with Michael. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I will uh, share my screen. Yeah, you can see my screen. Yes. Yeah. All right. So um, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, for my case, just to share our story about uh, Bioinformatics Hub of Kenya initiative. And uh, I'm based in Kenya, uh, Nairobi, and uh, sort of try to share how this community, a hub of bioinformaticians, uh, how it all started, uh, what are the achievements, what are the activities that we do, and what are the challenges that we experience as a community. Uh, so the idea was uh, to create a community where students uh, could interact with experts in bioinformatics and open science. And, and so at the moment, uh, we had not had the space where uh, students learning bioinformatics would actually interact with uh, already uh, experts in bioinformatics. And the founding members are five, and their names are here. Myself, I'm in the furthest left. And before even thought of actualizing uh, this community, we got mentorship from Open Life Science and uh, Toby Hodges was one of our mentors at the beginning of this. And this actually happened in um, 2020, around in February. February. And so uh, thinking about uh, a vision and a mission of our community, as I mentioned, bridging the, back, uh, the gap between well-established bioinformaticians and aspiring uh, bioinformaticians and trying to, you know, um, do this through training, mentorship, to enhance collaborations and foster quality scientific research in our region. And so um, we did that, um, started the community and some of the activities that um, we do is uh, Science Cafe uh, where students get to either in the master's degree, undergraduate and PhD get to present their research work uh, at this science cafe. So we have at least do it monthly and try to share and um, critique each other. So this is, you know, collaboration at the peer or rather peer learning. And also we uh, organize self-organized uh, workshops and we use our carpentry's training materials. For example, if you can think of uh, R, uh, Linux, et cetera. Uh, we also try and do conferences like uh, last year we had this year, last year, 
uh, we had a bioinformatics conference and try to share the next slide. Seminars also are organized to, these are actually out of the box um, discussions. Like last month, we had um, a seminar where uh, got a speaker to discuss about mental health. Um, and these are some of the things that in our community, people are struggling with uh, mental health, for example, they're doing their research and in their studies, for example. Um, we also started outreach uh, programs. So we try to sensitize bioinformatics. Um, this we started uh, in March. I'll share a photo of our first outreach event at the university level. So basically trying to um, sensitize bioinformatics and our concerns to high school students and also university students. And many organizations, it's always an annual general meeting that we do every uh, February of each year. Um, some of the successes and achievements uh, that we've had in the past two years is uh, we are fully registered as an ungovernmental organization in accordance to government uh, rule. And last year we won our first grant um, and did a an event on empowering researchers with bioinformatics and open science skills. And in this, we try to uh, sensitize by doing, uh, for example, fair symposium, train our, uh, our, our participants on bioinformatics skills and open science skills, and not only train them, but also introduce the train the trainer where uh, we, we collaborated with the carpentries and we got slot where our participants could actually be instructors. And I think more than half of the trainers actually completed uh, the session. And now we are also growing the uh, instructor uh, trainers in our community. And after that, they get to hack by doing small mini projects uh, where they could now start doing small bioinformatics projects or also open science uh, uh, projects. And at the end, try to collaborate in a conference where we do a conference to just accumulate the, all the events and try to uh, have students present their work. And also um, open bioinformatics fund this year to do a, a, a seminar on research development uh, RDMs and omics where we try to group students in different uh, bioinformatics areas, metabolomics, uh, genomics, proteomics, et cetera. And also this year we invited to uh, showcase bioinformatics in both Kenya. And it's good that the community is growing and we have almost 400 active members. So uh, this is a photo I, I like to share this because it's our first uh, outreach in one of the universities at called Technical University of Kenya. And we had uh, almost uh, more than 50 students uh, uh, completing their studies at the undergraduate level. And some of the challenges we faced is that uh, these students are actually doing uh, biological sciences, some uh, biochemistry, biotechnology, and yet they have zero idea or concepts of open science. So, either they are not taught in, in their curriculum or they have no clue. And so we introduce, try to um, sensitize the trends in bioinformatics and also try to group the students and get to understand if they have any idea on bioinformatics and open science. And if, if they'll actually be interested to do uh, projects on these fields and how us, bioinformatics hub of Kenya, we can try to help them, mentor them to do small projects on bioinformatics and open science. Some of the challenges uh, that we've had uh, over the time is we fail to reach some of the key actors in bioinformatics, especially uh, at uni university level, the lecturers don't get to, you know, get training on yeah. bioinformatics. And, and so, we have tried to now do more specific like 
um, creating workshops for these um, key actors in, in the field. And also um, resource constraints is one of our challenges, especially if you're trying to you know, organize workshops, low shading, internet speed, computational resources, especially with students. We give students many projects to do, and so computational is always a challenge. And also within the organization, uh, the leaders or the founders are trying to you know, balance between running the organization and also personal work. And we've now maybe trying to give incentives to members to you know, support some of the activities that they that they do to make grow the uh, the the hub. Um, so in helping us grow the community, you can always contact us. We have a website. I'll share the slide, so you can either contact us or join us. And every uh, description is in the in the in the website. Uh, at this time, we. Uh, for more information, you can always find us on Twitter, by Informatics Hub, by Info Hub KE, acknowledging some of the founders and the secretariat committee. And you can always reach us on uh, our email. We have a LinkedIn uh, profile, our website, and also the YouTube channel where we uh, post each and every activities that we, we do. I'd like to uh, thank our supporters and uh, uh, partners and thank you. Thank you, Michael. So thank you for the insights and from your perspective. I like the many offerings you provide and I hope we can discuss this later. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then last but not least, we continue with Martin. Hi everyone, if I sound a little bit weird, I woke up this weekend with a terrible cough, so I might sound like a frog eating my throat from the inside out, but yeah, I'm trying, I'm going to try my best. Okay, let's see this. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so um, I'm Martin Dreyer. I work at Northwest University in South Africa. Um, within the university, I work uh, in the information technology department. And at the moment, I'm a research analyst. So the carpentries were uh, stemmed from my previous post, but I'm still working at diving into the carpentries a little bit um, because I, I like the community so much. <laughs> okay, so where did we start? Um, we started with the e-research initiative back in 2015, actually end of 2014, start uh, begin 2015, and we had a vision. Within this vision, we said we need to support our researchers a little bit better. We, we need to get uh, up to date uh, with the international uh, community, the international initiatives. And we went to our research niche areas. We have a, a, a really big uh, bioinformatics um, I want to say hub faculty uh, department um, and they really do ground breaking work so we went to them for instance we went to the humanities we went to engineering uh, we have a, a really big engineering faculty as well and we spoke with all the the leaders and then we said okay now we have your idea let's speak to the people on the ground because you know sometimes the people on the ground has a little bit more info of the struggles and stuff and the people in charge are a little bit um focused on something else so we said okay let's see what we need and within that it came from they need some support um training sustainability was one of the biggest things that we talked about um community awareness because a lot of times you have these excellent community initiatives and nobody knows about it so we spoke about research data management with him uh, open science reproducible research is one of the biggest things that we try to focus on um, in this environment that we're in, if you can't reproduce your research, then you might as well just stop doing it. Uh, collaboration was one of the biggest things that, that we still struggle with today because a lot of people are in the mindset of um, this is my data. I'm paying for this research, so um, this is mine. Um, funding is, is a big issue, especially in Africa. Um, even in South Africa, funding is becoming a really big problem. 
And we also uh, came to the to computational and digital research and then stemmed to the skill set of our researchers. Now within this environment, within our vision and our initiative, we say, saw, okay, we need to do something. Okay, let me just do this. Okay, what we did was we launched the e-research initiative. We tried to speak with our researchers. We focused on researcher skills and that's where the carpenters came in. Uh, collaboration was one of the biggest things that came in and open science was sort of a, a swear word to some of our faculties but open science science is something that you can't get away from these days it's like electric cars it's going to be part of your life for, for quite some time so open science is something that we need to address and we said well even if you don't like it just years out we spoke about collaboration not only between departments but between universities between uh, regional areas um, we we have our one of our bioinformatics environments or actually more bio biochemistry they work with the university in australia and um, they share data and they pay for data and we pay for data it it's a it's a it's a big collaboration and um, the, the research outputs from that collaboration is really immensely important to the university because all of you know although the university says their main job is research the main idea of university is money but yeah okay so then came carpentry's membership why did we want to become a carpentry's member because the community was big um it still is and it's still growing and we aligned ourselves with with the community of, of the carpentries because we liked what they do and then some of our community initiatives are the slide was supposed to be a little bit later but okay um, we started with Raspberry Pi Hackathon. Um, Raspberry Pi Hackathon is an annual thing that we do on on our universe at our university, which we 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 say okay, we will provide you with a Raspberry Pi and some extra tools and functions. You tell us what you want to do with it, but it should fall under the 101 innovations idea of sustainable research, sustainable humanity, and so on. And um, most of the time, the undergrads actually prosper there. We had one person that fully automated the greenhouse, and it took them, uh, I think, two months to do that with only Raspberry Pi and some Arduino boards. Um, so it's really a good initiative. Um, we, it got hijacked <laughs> from me uh, to the Faculty of Natural Sciences. They sort of took over from me, and they carried on with it. And I'm, I'm really excited about this year because we have about... We started the first time we started it. We had five teams, and I think we we had thirty teams this year. So it's really growing. It's something that we see can go fall under the sustainable development idea. We also have uh, Python training schools that is hosted by our Center for High Performance Computing. Um, they specifically hosted to undergrads and postgrads to get uh, to make sure that the next generation of researchers don't don't fall into the same trap that our current generation has. Uh, we do provide some HPC training because we have our own HPC as well. And then RDM, one of the biggest things that came out was data. Where do I store my data? What do I do with my data? Um, how do I keep my data safe? And then we, we said, okay, let's look at Nextcloud. That's our on-prem for us, by us cloud environment where we give them storage space, make sure it's secure, as secure as we can make it, as well as the HPC. Then... After all of the work we did and the in-person workshops that we hosted, COVID-19 decided that um, it's gonna change our lives for better or worse, we're still thinking about it. So we started to say, okay, how can we keep on with the carpentries? How can we still do the carpentries? And we looked at everybody said, okay, we're working from home, we're working remotely. <laughs> And we started to do the online workshops. So we focused on specific parts in the, the online workshops. But then this came with a few challenges. Data, in South Africa, data is an issue because not everybody has uh, internet line at home. So most people work on either LTE or the mobile devices. Uh, connection is an issue. And we have this thing called load shedding, or actually just power failures in South Africa where our power, I want to say, um, ESCOM, our provider just switches off your power every now and then when they feel like it. 
Now, how did this change our workshop setup? We went from an in-person workshop, which was two full days. We mostly focused on art for ecologists and social sciences was also pretty popular, but we mostly focused on R. We went to the uh, online base and we said, okay, we can't have a 30 odd um, base anymore. So we're thinking about 15 people. We said, okay, let's change it from full days to half days because sitting in front of a computer screen, listening to somebody bubble for a full day is more tiresome than actually sitting in a class, talking to somebody next to you, having a coffee break, um, networking a little bit. So you're on your own. So we said, okay, let's focus on half day so we can still give people a chance to do work and to recover from whatever we did. And we try to focus on one tool per day. So on the first day, we'll focus specifically maybe on spreadsheets. Second day, we'll focus on open refine. And in the third, fourth, and sometimes fifth day, we'll focus on art. Depending on, on your um, group that you have, your participants, what level they are, uh, we mostly spend uh, two full day of two half days on art, or we will spend uh, two and a, one and a half day on art, so three half days on art. Okay, we also, within our membership, we have the instructor training. We have 30 instructor training seats. Uh, we used to have three trainers. Um, I'm the only one left, so it's it's quite <laughs> it's quite interesting. And um, we've been doing this online since 2020. Um, I think in the last four uh, four times. Yeah, we normally do uh, two different instructor trainings per year, and we give them enough. We try to fill the spaces, but as Lex also said, we do have a large drop out. Uh, or a no-show actually number. So we try and get as many people as we can. Our problem or the challenges that we have with instructor training specifically, people don't check out. Uh, they're really interested when you present everything to them, they don't check out. I don't know if the checkout is a little bit intimidating to them. I try to guide them through it as we go. Um, our onboarding, specifically the NWU's onboarding, I think uh, should be done better. Uh, I think we need to communicate a little bit better, stay in touch a little bit more. Um, we also have a lot of people that leave the institution, go and work uh, in the industry or just go to other institutions. And I call them token instructors. We have people that come to instruct training. They do the whole training, they check out, and then you never hear from them again. They never teach again. So it's like a tick box. Boom, I'm an instructor now, and that's it. So what are the challenges that we... Uh, face on a daily basis. Organizing workshops is a lot of time and effort, especially for online. Uh, although you only maybe teach for half the size, still the same amount of effort from my side, from the host side. Um, we have a lot of people that sign up and then show up. Um, I still don't know how to motivate them a little bit better to sign up. So we have a large signing up number and then when you get to the to the workshop you have four or five people that, that attend and some of them also filter out throughout the time. Um, what our community really needs now is to re-establish the study groups that we had um, to get better after workshop support and um, we used to have a general Q&A session where people could log on to a specific session or we uh, get together at a place on campus and then we work through specific uh, questions, um, specific uh, ideas within the community. So I think that's something I'd really need to, to look at again. Yeah, and that's that's my story. Um, just one thing to mention, we used to work with Mozilla Science a lot. Um, it's sort of died down a little bit since uh, one of my colleagues left. So that's also something that I think we, we, we can pick up again. So if you need any info, you can email us at eResearch at NWACZ or you can just email me uh, and then you can find me on Twitter or GitHub. And we also have a NW GitHub as well. Thank you, Martin. That was also really interesting. And I see we also have some questions for you. Okay, so first, thank you to everyone uh, from the panelists. 
Uh, I see in the etherpad that we collected some questions and I would like to start with them. Uh, so the first two are from me um, at Lex. Um, so do you see a difference in offering only single lessons? You talked about that you mostly do uh, workshops with a single lesson. Uh, and do you feel it is better received by the learners than doing an official workshop with three or four lessons? It's a good question because we never asked people. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it was a decision based on uh, it's easier to organize to get enough instructors and helpers for one lesson for a day or two half days than trying to get it all together for four half days or full two full days. Um, so, but we should have maybe asked them. And I think there's also an interest in occasionally doing a two day workshop, maybe even flying an instructor to teach something that we normally wouldn't teach or something like that, or get some ex external experience and networking. So I, I don't really know how to answer your question. I have to investigate. <laughs> okay, but it's, um, uh, I just wonder because we are now going to start to do this also. Uh, we usually do um, official workshops, but now thinking about, um, yeah, everybody has no time. So <laughs> why not do just one lesson? Um, okay, and my other question was how often- Can I can quickly, do... quickly add, because I think it, yeah. it also comes a bit from the, at the end of day two, people will be very tired and may yes. not and they may not absorb as much as they would do if they had a break and took the next part a week later. So that's also part of that. At least that's what we think, but we don't have any data on that. Do you have the feeling that you also have more time for one lesson if you split them? So yes. So for example, if we took the Unix shell lesson, normally it would be like in the morning, but we take the morning and take an hour after lunch to finish it up. So you have a bit less stress to get a bit further ahead you can do more exercises so that's also an, a benefit from the instructor instructor side okay that's what i thought <laughs> okay and my other question was uh, how often do you do the mentoring session um to check on the instructors we do them monthly okay so since they have 90 days that would be like if everybody was perfectly finishing the checkout in 90 days we would have three mentoring sessions and then maybe one to make sure that they transition into teaching but of course most people will be delayed so we talk a little bit about that don't forget to ask for an extension maybe people are worried that it's not possible or easy or we can help them with that and um, so we have had i think four meetings with the current cohort and i, I hope we can have another so you um, start to meet before the checkout, right? So when the instructor yeah. training starts, you already look for them. Yeah, first meeting is uh, a week or so after the training, two weeks maybe. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, there are other questions. I think I can read them for you. Uh, one is for Michael. Is there interest in your community to develop carpentry style lessons? Uh, well, um, yes, there's interest, but uh, at, the, at the moment we try not to in reinvent the wheel. So we take advantage of already uh, carpentry's materials to, you know, uh, uh, do our workshops. And I think from also my experience learning some of the concepts uh, using the, the these materials, the actually the, the content is really, really uh, good. And I mean, it's uh, for novices get to understand it better. So I, I don't know, maybe if we, we see if we can also adapt it to our community, but I, I'm always yeah. comfortable using the material. Yeah. Okay. Um, any more? Yeah, Lex. Yes. Uh, I asked this question because I, uh, we also, I'm, I'm from bioinformatics myself, my mm -hmm. background or my work area, and I'm teaching it a lot, but I so, do see so many people from life science attending workshops here and, and elsewhere. So there's a, probably a huge market for, for example, an RNA seq, sorry about the mm -hmm. target, an RNA seq lesson or a chip seq lesson or a variant calling lesson. And data carpentry has some genomics lesson, but there's like a huge potential. And I think it would be really cool if, if groups like you and also maybe others 
put together these kind of lessons in the incubator and see if they can make them as good as the other lessons that we already have. So that's uh, my hope okay. for the future. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. So uh, if I get correctly, more additional uh, content, yeah. Yeah, bioinformatics, life science specific mm -hmm. content for mm -hmm. carpentry styles, yeah. Yeah. All right, and then we have another question to Martin. Since you have 30 seats, do you do your instructor training workshops in person? If yes, do you see a difference compared to online, for example, when it comes to community building? Okay, um, we used to pre-pandemic days. Yes, we did do um, all our instructor trainings in person. Um, we also had some over-prescribed instructor training sessions. And I do see a, a massive, uh, I want to say, difference in checking out, uh, becoming part of the community, um, being a part of the community in the long term, um, in the, on a, a compared to online. I think online is a little bit... Um, in person is more, uh, I want to say, uh, you, you can do more. It's more, uh, you you draw them into the community a little bit more. They have more time to talk to you within the breaks, uh, network with their colleagues and stuff where, uh, compared to online. Uh, when you take a break, you're, you're on your own. So you have no one to talk to. Um, although you, I, I always make sure to give them uh, enough places where they can find me uh, if they really want some on uh, to ask me some questions or become part of the community um, but I, I, I do think we're going to move back to uh, in person again uh, by the end of this year uh, because I want I want people to to become part of the community uh, we like yes I, I definitely see a difference um, we try to get at least 10 people to check out every year uh, as you might know even though we have 30 seats not all of them check out so you get people that want to be instructors so bad and they do the checkout right real quickly and other people just uh, you know life happens so they never really check out and they don't come back uh, or they start working in another environment and stuff like that so yeah there's definitely a difference in in my environment okay thank you martin uh, additional comments on that? I can add one small thing. Um, we have experimented once with, because we only have five seats, six earlier, but now five, to have them sign up to the same training and put them together, offer them a room to sit together in with good Wi Fi and a good screen and everything when they do the training. And I think we should try it again because it may actually, those people then get connected already before they try to check out before they become part of the community. It's logistically not always easy because people might want to do training from home and stuff like that, but it is, it is an option. Okay, there's uh, one more question to all of us. Um, thank you for your Presentations. I'm interested in which lessons from library carpentry have been in demand or proved useful among your communities. Um, I can speak for myself uh, as I'm working in a library and we do the workshops. So uh, the one workshop we always do and uh, with what we started was um, the workshop with uh, Shell, with the Shell lesson, uh, Git lesson and Python. Um, this is what we started to do, and uh, we got great feedback from that. Um, and what we also do is uh, another workshop with SQL, uh, the Wikidata lesson, and the um, Tidy Data lesson, or Tidy Data and Software lesson, and um, the, let me think, the uh, the tidy data lesson and the fair and data software lesson. So these are our two um, workshop styles that we do and um, we always get good feedback, feedback for that. What about the others? No other libraries involved. <laughs> I 
Thank you, uh, Ravi. That was my question. <clears throat> so that's that's really good to hear. Um, it's um, I'm really I'd like to talk with you later on about the fair and data software lesson too, and mm -hmm. people's enthusiasm for that. Uh, sure. it, it may be side <laughs> sideways to um, other people's interests. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, do you have any other questions? You can also write them in the chat or raise your hand. So um, I have another question for every one of us. Um, um, we saw some uh, challenges from you uh, about access and uh, I would like to know what in your opinion is needed to ensure access to the Carpentries community and its resources. So um, for example, institutional memberships allow individuals to support their community through paid staff time. In some cases, um, most resources workshops are in the English language. Maybe this is something um, you challenge or your infrastructure challenges that we heard, like the internet access. Um, yeah, so what do you think is needed from the carpentry side? I know this is a big question <laughs> I'm asking because uh, this is something we talk about uh, in the community uh, development program. So how, what can the companies do to, um, to ensure your access? And maybe we have to think about that longer. Uh, maybe I can jump in. Um, I, I think... Uh, it's recently that uh, instructor, like for example, the instructor training, these uh, small incentive for uh, internet, especially for African countries. So which is really a good initiative to make sure all the participants actually attend. So, so far so good. Yeah, that was a good idea. Great, that's good to hear. Um, I think coming back to or going back a few years, uh, we really never never had the regional coordinators, and I think having the regional coordinators now has brought a whole new dimension to the carpentries and uh, building the community within an environment, uh, because you were sort of on your own for long, and if like we did a, a bunch of workshops at NWU. And when we wanted to start building the community, we went to the other universities like UCT and we went to uh, University of Venda and we went to Pretoria and so on. And we introduced them to the community and uh, to carpentry. And we had a lot of workshops there, Python workshops and all workshops and stuff. And having the original coordinator now that can speak to a bunch of different universities, I think is great. Um, and it's, a, it's one of the initiatives, one of the things that, that really helped me having somebody to bounce ideas off and tell, listen, we want, this is our plan for the next year. What do you think? Can you uh, introduce us to some people? And I think uh, your the regional coordinators being part of the core team, I think that's one of the best ideas that companies had in the last five years. Great. I like to hear that. <laughs> And I think it's uh, becoming even better with the new program so that you don't only have it for the regional aspect, but for the subjects. Can you explain that a bit more? 
Um, that's what I talked about in my uh, speech. So I, I have the feeling that sometimes I'm not the right person to speak because I'm um, more, um, yeah, for the general stuff <laughs> and not for the specific. So um, maybe there's a group of bioinformatics who want to know uh, which les lesson they can use and they could ask Toby, <laughs> but maybe they can ask a um, community coordinator who is uh, exactly for that reason a coordinator and can help them. So I just see it with uh, having three different regions, I'm not always capable to uh, cover everything and um, would like to see more um, coordinator for different reasons. Thanks, I understand. Looks to you so. Hey, um, one thing I would ask you, I saw it in some of your presentations, but uh, what do you do to support people after the workshop? So, uh, for example, we offer a hacky hour, which is um, yeah, an hour in our institution where everybody, where everybody can join and you can bring your little problem or project you want to um code on together or we do a project hackathon uh, this is what we do with participants from the workshops uh, like six weeks later they can come with their project they started and we um, discuss on it in a group but maybe there are other ways that you saw for helping them after a workshop or do you think do you have the feeling that uh, people afterwards um, stick on it and work on it on them on their server. Yes, Lex. Yeah, this is this is my main worry always. I always feel that we uh, do people a disservice. I mean, they're getting a great workshop, but then we send them home and they're on their own again. And um, so there's a bunch of folks that in our community started uh, study groups based on the Mozilla study groups uh, platform or uh, setup. But they are often doing small things that are not part of lessons or somebody wants to demonstrate something. And I would like, love to have study groups where there's continued learning. And, I, and we still haven't really figured out how to do that. I think we are just so busy with getting instructors trained and getting them to teach and organizing workshops and all that, that it falls a bit between the cracks, but I think it should be a really obvious next step to provide continued learning. So we actually make sure that folks are able to use what they've learned in our workshops afterwards. So it's for us, it's a big gap. And for me, it's a big, uh, not a big, but it's a bit of a headache. <laughs> uh, I have the same feeling. Michael? Uh, yes, uh, I think for, for our case, we try to, like when I was sharing uh, last year, we, we train and, and let the students also hack. And so for, for, for our case, we had uh, bioinformatics workshops. So we have 20, uh, 20, 25 students, and then we provide them with five mini projects of different, uh, uh, areas of bioinformatics and we give them uh, six weeks to do the mini project yeah and so they apply whatever they've learned in the workshop and then towards also so how these mini projects are just to reproduce already published uh, paper and so we choose a paper where they can get all the data and so then data doesn't become a challenge for them so they reproduce and we don't always have uh, the limit of saying oh you have to like reproduce it to the end where uh, the analysis got you in six weeks you get to now represent present on the last week what you've done and what you've learned out of the paper so i think for us it really worked uh, at least the uh, students got an application of whatever they, they learned that's a great idea and you can also see how far they 
come with it. Yeah, exactly. And, and weirdly, you'd see when uh, some analyses uh, might be a bit different uh, with already that what has been published and, you know, students get to be excited and curious about these analyses along the way. Okay. I have no more questions. Do you would like to discuss any more topics that we spoke about? Yes, Michael. So, so I mean, uh, this I picked from Marty's presentation about uh, participants signing in uh, in a workshop and then either half uh, you get the people who attend that uh, the workshop and then half of them attend or you get a few number. I don't know what uh, people can recommend on at least making sure you get more than 80% of the people to attend, especially for free workshops that um, we offer. Uh, what is the best way to make sure participants actually attend these workshops? Yes, like so. If you ask the carpentries, the standard answer is to charge a small fee for participating because then they have invested some money. And then, for example, use that money to buy tea and coffee or maybe fruits or something. And uh, I think that's still a good answer, but it has logistic uh, problems because then you have to set up a pay system. And if you sometimes at universities, if you charge for a workshop, and use a room from the university, then the university wants some of the money, all these kind of things. But if it's possible, it may actually be a, a solution. And beyond that, what we sometimes do is we um, send them an email. Um, well, for a workshop that are really quickly fully booked, we don't open them too early. If you open them too early, lots of people sign up, completely forget about it. And then a week mm -hmm. for the before the workshop, they thought, oh no, I have something else in my agenda, I don't come. So for the for the really popular ones, we sign up quite late, so it's really fresh. And otherwise, we could um, send them reminder emails and ask and and tell them that there's people on the waiting list. Ask them to sign off, and then of course your system needs to hopefully they can sign them off themselves because it's much easier, mm -hmm. less work for you. And that yeah. system then hopefully immediately assigns another person the spot. But it's still it's it's still difficult. You still get lots and lots of those shows. Mm -hmm. Toby, has a comment. Do you mind if I, I give an answer to this question? Um, in my previous job, when we were running workshops um, for our institute, um, we used the threat of a small no-show fee. So the workshop was free as long as you came, but we told people that if they signed up and then didn't show up, then we would send an invoice to their research group leader um, to charge charge for their not showing up out of the research group budget and this was well honestly it was an empty threat um, that would have been that would have taken too much time and been too much work to actually do but it was extremely effective we used to get a very high no-show rate and after we did this um, most people would show up or we would get at least a last minute super apologetic email um, <laughs> from someone who was clearly very worried that we were about to annoy their um, group leader. Uh, but it's it's only really effective, I guess, if you're 
offering workshops within an institute so you can use that kind of method i mean if, if you tell people just from the general public that if they don't show up you're going to send them an invoice then well you would to make that threat even sound convincing you need to get their postal address and so on right and i mean um it's all a lot of work but but for anybody here who's wondering about this and is running workshops internally to their organization doesn't want to actually do any charging of anybody but wants to still increase the attendance rate i can definitely recommend that method yeah i really like that idea maybe we will try that too uh, what we also do is uh, so i think we all have the same problem um Uh, we most of the time we offer more places than we really want to fill so um, our workshops are planned for 20 uh, participants or students and we offer 40 play uh, 40 seats uh, because uh, in general 50 percent will not show up it's a little bit risky so if everybody comes we have 40 people Uh, so we do not raise it too high that we can't handle it if everybody would show up. Janetta. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I was just on the bus and I'm working, walking to work, so I hope you can hear me and I don't say that. Um, at my institution, we have Uh, what Toby suggested, but it just doesn't work for us. Um, they, uh, this is like a standing thing, all workshops that are offered if people don't show, they, they will be charged 50 pounds. It's never really enforced, but it also, for us, it just, didn't work, it just doesn't work. Um, so, um, yeah, I, it doesn't seem to work always have the same effect. Okay, so uh, did I get you correct that Toby's um, suggestion didn't work for you? Yeah, that's right. Um, they're supposed to send uh, the PI uh, a 50 pound invoice if the student doesn't show. Um, But we still had a lot of no-shows. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other topic you would like to discuss? Okay, if there are not any more questions or something you would like to discuss, I don't want to um, yeah, force you to stay the last 12 minutes. Uh, we can stop here. Uh, I really like the discussion. Thank you for everyone who participated. Um, so we can stop the recording now. Or Toby can stop it.